Hello and welcome to the Analytic Show, the podcast of business through the lines of data science. But together, we'll dive into learning and sharing where various industries are heading and how data and analytics is at the heart of shaping business growth and productivity. Let's spark different ways of thinking about data and analytics that is relevant to you and prepare your business for future disruption. I'm your host, Jason Tan. I'm delighted you could make it on this journey with us. Hey guys, to continue to get support tips, techniques, and tools, and learn from the expert, hit that subscribe button wherever you are so we can keep in touch and continue our lifelong learning together. So, are you using your company data to its full potential? Take our embedded analytic assessment to find out your score. A leading organization like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google have moved beyond dashboard and embedded data science directly into their daily business operation. With our three-minute test, you will discover your potential in optimizing customer experience and revenue through embedded analytics. You will gain greater clarity, insight, and advice to embed analytics. Plus, you will receive customized results instantly. Find the link to this assessment in the description of this episode. Hello, 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 Rohit. Welcome to the Analytics Show podcast. Thank you so much for uh, taking your busy time out to come and share with me and the listener worldwide about uh, some of the works that you guys are doing to simplify the insurance at the Tune Protect. Super excited to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot, Jason. Same here. I'm very excited to be uh, here. And obviously, the topic is very interesting because, as you know, I started off as an analytics professional about 20 years back. So, yeah. I know, right? That is exactly the first question that I had prepared for you. I know that, like you say, that uh, you started your career as a data analysis, uh, sorry, data analyst. And uh, now you're the CEO of an insurance company. I think that is really inspiring for a lot of the uh, listener who are in the doing the technical works for the uh, data analytics. I really want to uh, get a little bit out from your experience in in that. But uh, first question first: Has it been a rewarding journey? Oh, absolutely! Right, um, it's been a very rewarding journey. I started off my career in two thousand three in AXA as a as a data analyst who was basically doing. Uh, desktop research initially, then market analysis, and so on and so forth. Uh, I was crunching customer numbers, you know, uh, mm. doing surveys and stuff. And uh, in 2017, I became a CEO at 37 years, which was the youngest CEO at that time in Malaysia. Wow. Um, and, and obviously, it's been a very rewarding journey, challenging one. But I think my core foundation in analytics helped me a lot. Mm. Uh, in, in building myself because insurance by nature is data driven right it's it's uh, numbers and i think being an analyst being a being from the data science background mm. helps you in insurance because you tend to be able to make decisions faster because mm. you, uh, you have probably a better sense of what the data is trying to say absolutely what have you found um, to be the most significant paradigm shift that you need to make from someone working in the data and analytic world to, to running an insurance portfolio as an executive? What do you think is the biggest shift? I think um, there's two or three parts to this. One is we all like data, right? We all salivate on data. But if, if that's what gives you the thrill, then of course you have an opportunity to continue to grow in the data science practice and you know become a chief data officer and various other things. But if you want to go into a generalist role, then I think there's three parts to this. One, you have to be open uh, to trying out new stuff. Uh, you can't just remain in data and say, I'm going to keep reading data, keep analyzing data, keep drawing out models. You have to go out there and get your hands dirty. So one mm -hmm. is you have to be open to trying out new stuff. The yeah. second one is nobody's responsible for your career more than you. Um, mm -hmm. That's something I've always said, you know, companies can help you. Of course, companies play a part. Your bosses can help you. Uh, but at the end of the day, 99% is with you. So when I've always picked a role, 
I have always picked the role, keeping the role, keeping where I want to be five years from now. Because the next role will happen. If you're an analyst, you will become a senior analyst. If you're a senior analyst, you will become a manager. What's what's the big deal about that? Right. If, you're, if you're half good, you will become that. Now the question is, if you want to be a CEO, does moving from analyst to senior analyst to manager to senior manager get you there? It may not. And that's why many times the role you take next is not the most important. The role you, what you're planning next, keeping in mind the future is the most important point. The, the third part I would say is uh, being very um, open to these softer aspects of work. Um, it's, it's very important to go out there, meet people, understand the market we operate in, the qualitative aspects behind the data. Yeah. Uh, because the data may tell you A, but you still need to know from the ground. Uh, you know, I, I always have this joke, which I share with people, right? Um, sometimes as data guys, we go and tell business, this is what you have to do. Mm. Why don't you try telling a sales head who's been doing the job for 20 years based on the data, this is what I recommend. Because he or she knows what sort of resistance or what sort of, uh, you know, reality is there on the ground. Uh, so that's why it's very important to be not only in the back, but also in the front. That is so true about the third point, um, not to just to sit in the corporate office, but uh, get out there, talk to the front line. Um, I want to dwell into the second point that you just shared, where you were talking about um, taking a different kind of role for the longer perspective. I suppose the question I have for you though, is that I think a lot of people, myself included, would often think that um, from being promoted from the analyst to senior analyst to a manager, senior manager, on that vertical is very clear and easier and be, because from the branding perspective it helps people to know that exactly what you are trying to achieve sometimes taking the generalist i think um it really helpful if other have that expectation or other can see the lens of how you can combine discipline in order to drive the business but yet to certain company they may not be able to see that picture so my question is then how do you find the right balance or or, or perhaps knowing that taking different kind of role while it may be a temporary step back but in the long run it will be helpful how do how do you chart that forward see first thing is confidence right if you know your area of expertise very well so in this case let's assume you are really good as a data analyst even if you chart out to another career, remember your base is strong. If that doesn't work, you can always come back. I remember when I moved from strategy to operations, I remember my, um, you know, my coach telling me uh, that be mindful that you've been very successful in strategy, but you may really suck at operations, right? Because it's very different. Mm -hmm. And you need to be prepared for it because operations is day to day, day to day. Customer said this, you know, IT problems. It's not like strategy, which are different kind of, you know, pressures. Now, obviously, I went into operations knowing if I don't have something operational in my CV, I can't become a CEO. Mm -hmm. I can't just say I have strategy, data, you know, uh, you know, those kind of expertise, and I can become a CEO. Now, it is also possible that I may not have succeeded in operations, but. I didn't care because at the end of the day, what's my risk? I can always go back to strategy, which I was, which I knew I was very good at. So that's the key thing. Confidence is where your decision starts. We have to have the confidence um, to take that leap of faith. Uh, most breakthroughs happen from leap of faith. Yes. I think that taking that calculated risk is so important. Now, apart from all of those things that you have just shared, what other advice you would give to the analytic professional or someone who is in the GM uh, of the data science or GM of decision science or analytic, who is interested in making a similar career progression as yours if they start from today? Sure. I, I think uh, the first thing is, keep yourself open, meet mm. as many people as you can. The only way to know what's out there is by meeting people. Um, the second thing is 
prepare yourself to unlearn. There's a lot we will have to unlearn when we move roles. The third one is, I have a simple framework in my head that new company, new country, new boss, it's, it's normally the, the chance of failure is very high. You have to have something you're comfortable with. So if you know the company, it's easier to move within the company, even if it's a new geography and a new boss. If you know the boss, but if the country company is different, you still have some consistent basis. Mm. So I think that element is important when you move because you don't want to move so far that it's a new country, new domain, new geography, uh, sorry, new boss, new company. If all the four are new, the chance of success is very limited in my view. That is a good point. I thank you for sharing that framework and also uh, your experience from moving from uh, data analytic to executive running the insurance. Now, I want to move into talking about the, the, the works that you do as the group chief executive officer at Tune Protect. Tell us a bit more about your role and the company itself. Thank you. So I, I'm, uh, I'm, I manage uh, Tune Protect Group, which is a smallish uh, listed insurer out of uh, Malaysia. Uh, we are an ASEAN based in short tech. Uh, we have a uh, presence in Malaysia. We have presence in Thailand. We have presence in Middle East. Uh, we have uh, a tech business, which we call white label, which uh, supports a lot of businesses. And we have a reinsurance business, which supports insurance partnerships in 30 over countries. Our mm -hmm. differentiation is we are a digital insurer. Essentially, um, we, uh, as our tagline says, insurance simplified, we have a simple commitment, which is called the 333 commitment, which is you can buy from us in three minutes, you can hear from us in three hours, and we will pay your claims in three days, except, you know, health, which is obviously cashless and, you know, uh, commercial claims and motor garage. I, I think other than that, we generally pay within three, three days. In fact, 87% of our claims today is paid within three days. Um, and, you know, we pride ourselves in uh, uh, our customer satisfaction as well. Uh, we are driven by NPS. Um, that's something we heavily focus on. Well, that is, I don't call it smallish. That seems like a 30 plus market is quite a, a big achievement. Now, uh, you talk about these insurance simplify and uh, the 333 framework. Uh, let's dig a little bit deeper in that. How, how would that compare to other insurers that are in the same market that you are operating in? So I'll give you a very simple example. Our customer NPS, um, which, uh, which was an independent study done by a research firm which came out recently. Our customer NPS in the first half was 38, plus 38, um, while uh, some of our peers who were in the study was half of that. Um, so that gives us a bit of confidence that our customers see, customers see how different we are. Now, the second part to that question is, um, I'll give you another example. Uh, we recently had an opportunity last year where, when the COVID situation was happening, that one of the countries was opening up their uh, market for people to enter. And uh, there was a, a request for insurers to come and participate. We were informed on a Friday evening that it's opening up. Uh, on a Saturday morning, we had a call and we had to go live on Wednesday. We were the only insurer who said we can go live on Wednesday. Three months after we went live, no other insurer had gone live as yet. Uh, and, and that's our ethos. We are fast. We can't be the big boys, right? So we don't have the balance sheet of the big boys. Um, so our biggest differentiation is we are nimble. Our tech is we our APIs are extremely easy to work with. Um, and uh, we build products which are meant for this industry. So as an example, our product philosophy is we will build insurance like an airline ticket. What does that mean? When you buy today a budget airline ticket, you buy an airline ticket. Now, which seat you sit in or who, what food you eat, you pay for it and you choose. The same way we are saying we'll send you a simple insurance product. Now, on top of that, if you want additional features, you click and you buy. So it's mm -hmm. kind of different to the traditional method where we come and tell you, you have to buy 36 critical illness, you have to buy 64 critical illness, where you don't even know what those illnesses are. 
Instead, mm -hmm. we tell you, you can buy two, you can buy five, you can buy 39, you, you make it because it's your choice. And for someone who's just starting off their career or probably two or three years into their life, they probably don't want to buy a 64 CI, you know, where mm -hmm. most of the critical illness you've never even heard. So that's the way we, you know, differentiate our proposition. And our focus is on millennials and zillennials. That makes sense. Now, I'm curious to know what would be the key leading indicators that you you are you are using to measure the success on this front then? Great question. I'm not, I, I, I look at uh, a few lead indicators. Um, that's a great question because I think too long insurance, we make this mistake of looking at lag indicators. Lag indicators, financial KPIs take time for it to flow through. So I think we look at um, customer traction, i.e. how much more customer and I'm, am I acquiring in my preferred uh, segment? How long are they staying with me? Are they staying longer with me quarter by quarter? Mm. Um, are they buying more from me? Yeah. And obviously overall, are they more satisfied with me? Are they ready to you know, recommend me to more insurers? If I have these, then it essentially means that I'm getting more people to buy. They're staying longer with me. They're buying more from me and they're recommending more people, which means my cost of acquisition is coming down and my retention is better, which means I should, it should flow through to the p &L. Good stuff. Now, now that we have the context uh, in place about the company, the numbers, uh, the key area that you look at uh, in terms of the KPI, the metrics, and also what you are trying to achieve as in Insurance Simplified, my question for you then is, where do the tech and data come into the picture to help you to achieve all of that? Very vital. Uh, but I always say tech and data enables the business. Mm. Uh, many times we like to glorify tech um, uh, when, you know, it's not the technology you choose, the fancy technology that you choose that makes a difference. It's the technology that facilitates the business objective that makes the difference. It's the same with data. Sometimes, you know, data and data uh, professionals can salivate over the most fancy data models but mm. if it's not creating business impact um, it doesn't facilitate it doesn't help my business as an example for an insurer roughly 20 percent of my uh, resources across the group by next year mm. will be from tech so you can imagine how big that is it's not common in insurers to have 20 percent of your total resources from technology so that's how important tech and data for us is Mm -hmm. um, we look at um, tech and data with three broad lenses. One is tech is our biggest differentiator in terms of nimbleness, agility, et cetera. Absolutely. The data drives us at two levels. One is data drives us with day-to-day -day decisions, but data also empowers our innovation. Now I'll come to that in a minute. Yeah. The third part of tech and data is we always believe in small projects. We are not the types who believe in investing in millions in one large project and then you know not knowing what the ROI is going to be. So I we like I <laughs> yeah, I like to work on an agile mode, which says, I give you so much, I give you so much time, go and do it. Uh, except our core infra program where we're doing a core transformation, but that's a multi-year, multi-million, 37 million project, but that's an exception. Now, coming back to wh what we do on data, I'll give you an example. Uh, today with our mobile app, um, which is quite useful, and you know, I, I, you know, if you are around Malaysia or Thailand, you can download our mobile app um, and you can check it out. Uh, with our mobile app, you can do almost everything, right? You can do your yeah. servicing, your claims, your buying. But beyond that, we now have um, pay as you drive, which obviously I get your driving data. Um, we are launching um, health tech propositions, so we will start tracking your sleep, your your steps, and you know those kind of things. Yeah. Now what is eventually happens is now here I have your driving data and your health data, so I can hyper personalize and hyper customize the services for you, because I could come to a situation where hey Jason, I noticed that you know you walk ten thousand steps, you pretty much you know slept pretty okay uh, or 6,000 steps. Um, for the record, people don't walk many steps. Huh? The 10,000 steps is 
kind of overused in the market. I'll give you our data, 3% 3, 3 of the customers walk 10,000 steps. So if you go out and do a campaign which says, walk 10,000 steps, most people are gonna say, that's a joke of a campaign, I'm never gonna get there. <laughs> now, and this is where data is useful because the health guys will tell you, customer has walked 10,000 steps. But the, the, the guys in the front will tell you, but customers don't walk 10,000 steps. <laughs> so what's the point of going and putting 10,000 steps as a requirement? Many people are not even going to qualify. So the question is, how do we engage them? So if I tell you, Jason, I have your data and I can give you 25% off on your renewal because you're, health, you're healthy and you've driven relatively well, or I give you 30% off on your next new product because of the data. Or if I throw you a very simple thing in the morning to say, hey, today, if you walk 10,000 steps, I give you 5% off on your next month's renewal, or I give you a free coffee. It's a better engagement than what insurers thought maybe when we started off saying everybody has to walk 10,000 steps. It, it doesn't happen. It exactly. doesn't happen. Everybody has to sleep seven hours. It doesn't happen. Exactly. Uh, you look at my sleep pattern. One day I sleep seven hours. The other day I sleep four hours because that's, that's life. You know, mm. it, it's great to be by the book. I would love to do it, but that's also reality. So as insurers, we also need to understand how we use the data, um, mm. engage the customer. So for me, that's a key area where, you know, we like to use data. And yes. obviously data helps us a lot on claims because telematics, for example, obviously with telematics, you can drive variables to track the customer, but also it helps in recreating uh, claims, uh, mm. accidents, and you can check for fraud. Um, so obviously I'm not going into those you know, details, but yeah, there's, there's a host of things we can do for sure. I, I thought that the telemetric with the motor vehicle insurance, um, has been tried and tested in a lot of market, but it looks like no one has managed to make it a success yet in terms of the pickup rate. I think people are still You're very going to, yeah. I think, think there's, um, I think there's three reasons. Um, mm -hmm. I, I tried it as well and very limited um, traction, even though it's a great idea, the market clap, you know, a lot of public, a lot of uh, press uh, uh, coverage, but the number okay. doesn't. Yeah. I tell you why. There are three reasons. One is for telematics to work, you need strong regulatory push. There has to be a compulsion from either the motor authorities or from the you know, other authorities to get people to do it and there's some benefit out of it beyond mm. the benefit insurance gives okay the second one is and, and there are some examples obviously in europe around italy and russia where we've seen slightly better traction than you know this part of the world mm. the second one is um it requires um it, it requires a very interesting mindset change because i'll tell you why the one who drives well so if you look at most insurers, roughly 30% of the customer is where they make money. 60 to 70% of the motor driver average market, right? There's some exemptions here and there. They don't make money. Now, what happens is that good 30% will go for telematics. The one who knows he doesn't drive well, he yeah. doesn't use telematics. So what happens? You end up giving discount to the good customers. And the ones who we think we want to change behavior doesn't change because he doesn't want to move to telematics because you're giving choice to the customer, right? Mm. But it's not a government push. If you may say so. Now, the third part of it is data privacy concerns. We have seen customers being worried about telematics and the fact that we are tracking them at that level yes. and they're concerned. They're concerned about the company having access to data of where they were every day, every evening. Um, you know, I'll tell you a joke when we did some of the uh, road shows. I was part of the road show when we launched Telematics uh, a few years back in my previous company. <clears throat> and we used to do the road shows. And invariably, after I present, there would be five or 10 hands up. Most of them would be guys. And the first question was, Oh, so my wife can track me on a Friday evening where I was having beer. And I used to, <laughs> we all used to laugh. So, you know, that's, it, it's a joke, but on a more serious note, it, it, it highlights the data privacy concern. People have. Absolutely. Yeah. Do you think that sort of uh, result 
and in terms of the pickup rate would be translating into the health insurance where we are trying to use the health data the 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 the, the wearable the data from the wearable devices or our mobile devices uh, to improve the insurance etc cetera, etc cetera. do you think that would see the same thing i i, I think it's i know it's probably too early to tell but uh considering the history that we are seeing um and yet this sort of uh, insurance concept in the health insurance is still new how do you think it's gonna yeah out? i think i think that's a journey all of us are starting on the wearable mm -hmm. and health data because i think there's a few few challenges here right as i said if you look at some of the data from our health tech providers the average steps done in some countries is three and a half thousand <clears throat> so the traditional ten thousand steps don't work mm. monday to friday saturday sunday it's different people walk much more typically <laughs> depending <laughs> where you are <laughs> depending where, what country you are that's in. what i said that's what i said right uh, <laughs> it really depends on countries because how much they use private transport public transport makes a big difference mm -hmm. now coming back um I, I think on the health side there's two or three aspects the data itself is changing because somebody would tell you if you speak to one doctor they will tell you please check your bmi and the other one will tell you BMI is irrelevant if you're muscular. So again, there's a lot of arguments on what measures you want to use. Yeah. Right. So, which is why a lot of us, yes, we are starting with some sort of wearable data, but I think it's much more than that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the mental health aspect. Physically, you could be very healthy and mentally, you know, if you're a disaster, that's where the rubber is going to hit the road, right? And and we know the pandemic has heightened the whole focus on mental health. So we, for example, tied up with Naluri, which is a mental health platform. We offer a, a proposition to our health customers who buy it online, for example, where we actually offer Naluri services. Um, so again, on the health data, what sort of data do we capture? And what does the customer get back because of it? Um, so, for example, during COVID, we did a very simple innovation in Thailand, which was well received by the market. We actually launched uh, tele assistance, even with a travel insurance. Now, travel insurance, the ticket size is so small, so most people don't do it. You do it in health products. But what happens is when you go to a new country and you are in, in quarantine for seven days, your yeah. head is playing all sort of games. Sometimes you want to speak to a doctor. You're too scared to tell the hotel that something is happening because the hotel might just move you to a hospital. <laughs> so giving them that access to a, a, a you know a telehealth service with travel insurance was mm. a very unique differentiation now that was real health intervention so you know that's where we also need to be practical of how we use our health propositions uh, instead of just using a blanket you know offer hey y'all i just want to give a quick shout out about this episode is sponsored by the Embedded Analytic Program at DDA. And the Embedded Analytic Program is designed for senior manager and executive in the business team who want to integrate data science into daily business operation and use it to drive customer experience excellence and revenue. A book unlimited strategy session for a full year and start embedding analytics into the business front line. For more information about this program, please refer to the description of this episode. Now, let's get on back to the interview. I love it. I love it. Now, what, there's one thing that I, uh, I read when I was uh, researching to prepare for this podcast interview is that you wrote this blog article. Uh, you talk about the standoff between the old guts, i.e. The, the traditional insurer and the insurer tech in the industry. And uh, in, you also talk about how they should really try to work together. Uh, my question for you then is, now that you have worked on the both sides, uh, what would you say to echo that steep, uh, sentiment? Or perhaps you have something different uh, to say? So I think this journey, everybody's gone through a journey. Initially, mm -hmm. large companies uh, looked at InsurTech as competitors. Right. Uh, and a lot of large companies just completely ignored the insurtech saying, you can't do what I'm doing. Similarly, the insurtechs came in and said, 
I'm the new boy in town. I'm going to completely disrupt the big boys and make, you know, <laughs> make them obsolete. And you're going to have a Nokia or a Kodak moment. <laughs> Actually, none of that happened. The traditional players continued. The insure tech, some came, some went. And then we realized, the traditional players realized how much ever we try, if we appoint the youngest guy in the room as a chief transformation officer, the smartest guy, or if we put millions in an innovation center, all this is not going to drive real change. The, that we can partner with insure techs mm. on specific problems. So it could be claims, it could be fraud, it could be distributing it to a specific customer group. There are different ways in which we can partner with them. And InsurTechs also realized that we do need to play with, we do need to partner with the big boys because they have a balance sheet, they have a relationship with the regulator, they've been there, done that. So I think that way there was a lot more coming of minds, if I may say so. So I think that's kind of a journey that the industry has also gone through. That today we don't see InsurTechs as a competitor. And mm-hmm. vice versa, InsurTechs don't see traditional insurers as oh, we are here to take your business away. It just doesn't work that way. I, I think there's a space for all players. I agree. Now, uh, it got me thinking, and I'm going to put you on the spot. If you were to go out and start your own startup and your insurance business or insure tech business, how are you going to approach it so that you can be the biggest player in 20 years' time? How, how, how would you win that? I think, I think even in, in business, um, I'm not an entrepreneur. So first of all, I'm an intrapreneur, but I'm an angel investor as well. So I have a portfolio that I invest into as well. I, I think mm-hmm. there's three simple uh, points, which are not simple in actual practice, of course. Uh, yeah. The first one is start with a customer pain point. There has to be a real customer need and a pain point. Okay. Uh, second is there has to be a strong team backing it and it has to be a cross-functional team who's able to challenge themselves. The third is you should be ready to pivot. You have to be ready to pivot. You have to be ready to move. Uh, you can't be stuck. Um, and that's very, very important. Mm-hmm. Now, earlier on, you talk about... Because the- because just going back on this point, most startups will tell you the initial idea and the idea that actually got it, got them home, there's no connection. Because you're pivoting, you're pivoting, you're pivoting, yeah. you're pivoting. That's very important. Absolutely. Still agree. Uh, I certainly have... Tr- I think it's the same thing with the analytic project or tech. Uh, transformation program uh, within the company as well, which is why when you were saying that it's always is best to start small is was totally music to my ear because I think what I have found over the year is starting small allowing you to pivot to really solving the real problem that you discover as you go through that journey. When you when the team is too too big or the project is too big, it become challenged because everyone has their own opinion. Everyone has a stake in the project and it make the moving and the pivoting so much more challenging. I, I think that apply to, to the uh, projects within the corporate as well. Uh, so, so much so with the startup. So I, I guess the question is how do we handle success and failure, right? And, and sometimes the pivot doesn't work as simple as, you know, that's where you're going. I, I think the key is celebrate small wins. It's very important to celebrate small successes. Uh, the second one, which I'm going to say, I'll probably go into a little detail later, institutionalize failures. It's very important as a leader to be vulnerable. Gone are the days where, as leaders, we thought our bosses know everything. And when I reach that level, I'm going to know everything. I can tell you when I reach that level or whatever that so-called level in life, in, in, in career, not in life, I realized I know as little as I knew before. It's just that I know a little other things, uh, but I, <laughs> I still know very, very little. 
and I still fail a lot. And, and I've said it many times, you, I think you would have read it, that I've been, I've been you know, close to being fired a few times in my life, right? Because innovation comes with a cost. Mm. Um, and, and so I think it's, it's very important um, for us as, as professionals to understand that when you, when you try out new stuff, uh, there will be failure. And we need to talk about it. We need to understand what we learned from it. Mm. Stand up and move on. Mm. And the third one, for me, the most important one is if your team needs motivation, you have the wrong team. Yeah. While I, I agree that yeah. yes. when, I hear these, when I hear some of these uh, you know, audio and video clips and speeches, right? Yes, yes, motivation videos. I go, actually, if I need someone to motivate me at my work, then I'm at the wrong place. Yes. So the team has to have that self drive. Nobody else should be able to motivate them. They should be motivated. So I think that's the environment, the culture we have to create. If it's a mm. culture where one person has to motivate the team, it's a wrong culture. Mm. So I think that's where, you know, um, I, I would say broadly the three elements. And last one I would say is have simple lead KPIs. So people can very clearly see where we are going. Too many times we have these big bank financial KPIs, top line, bottom line, top line and bottom line take time, right? And there are many other actions which result in top line and bottom line. Uh, so that's why it's very important to have actionable KPIs which are much more easier for people to see. And a leading KPI. Yeah. <laughs> Early on, you spoke about the partnership and I know that partnership is uh, one of your critical corporate strategy. Uh, I, I, I read that digital and affinity partnership are the key strategy that you use in the uh, for Tune product. Tell us more about it. So in terms of partnerships, I think, as I said before, there are things we are good at, there are things we are not good at. And mm. that's where partnership comes in, right? It's, it's a equal play. And for mm. us, we have strongly believed in digital partnerships. In fact, we had three digital partners other than our shareholder before I, when I joined. And in the last 20, 20, 22 months, and not because of me, it's because of uh, the team, uh, we have 58 over partners, right? And these partners come from all walks of life. The idea here is how can we reach to a customer base which has loyalty or connection with that base? So I'll give you an example. Today, a consumer doesn't want to come looking for an insurer sometimes because their affinity may be with a telco, for example. So then they want to buy with the telco or they want to buy an embedded insurance with an, with something which makes sense. When you travel, you want to buy a travel insurance. You don't want to buy a travel insurance just like that. Mm. When you buy a phone, you want to buy a phone protection. Mm. So the whole idea is how do we embed insurance in the simplest way, working with these partners who have access to that customer base the analogy that I often use to describe this sort of scenario or the work that I do is uh, how do you integrate yourself? How do you integrate yourself, your product into the ecosystem of someone else? How do you integrate yourself into a platform of someone else? And likewise, from the other way of looking at that is how do you build yourself to become a platform or how do you view yourself an ecosystem of allowing others to integrate with you i think that is one of the <clears throat> the best strategy that that i have seen working in expanding the customer base fair point yeah i can't deny that <laughs> <laughs> now next question on that i want to divide that a little bit more um for the listener who may not be familiar with the Malaysia or Tune Protect, 
um, Chimbotech is part of the Capital A, which is part of the uh, Asia group, uh, it was called, uh, but has been renamed to the Capital A. So my question is then, on the note about the partnership, does this extend to the partnership within the umbrella of Capital A and its subsidiary to, to enjoy all the distribution channel? So um, Cap Capital A owns about 1-4% of Tune Protect. Yeah? So Tune Protect is an independent listed company. Mm. Uh, they're very proud to be associated with Capital A, but uh, mm. we don't fall within their subsidiary list. So obviously, oh, right. Mm -hmm. But having said that, obviously, it's a big thing for us to be associated with Capital A, the huge ocean. We work very closely with the group. Uh, we work with all the businesses under Capital A. And for me, it's my biggest strength, right? The fact that I have access to this AirAsia customer base. Um, and also, I have access to the entrepreneurial culture they have and all the new businesses they have. So we work very closely with uh, several businesses they have. And taking a step back again, how does the data and the analytics come together uh, to complement or assist in creating these digital and affinity partnership from your angle? Great point. So I think first thing is we do, whenever we launch, typically traditionally insurers always did technical gates, which is does this product make profit? Does this product, you know, uh, what are the technical levers to look at, etc. In our case, we look at customer approval process. Okay, so first thing is we do a focus group discussion with our preferred customer segments. We do ethnography research. We first find, identify whether this proposition makes sense from a customer standpoint, be it in terms of product, claims, or service. The second part, then only we do the technical gate, right? So I think this is where we use data to do consumer study and figure out whether the data makes sense from a product perspective. The second we do is then we jointly co-create a product. Obviously, this is where insurers have a ton of data, you know, mortality data, morbidity data. So we look at whether these products make sense. The third is depending on what the consumer say we throw out the consumer journey with the partner what's the ideal consumer journey many times we i actually un, un, different to popular uh, way we actually want our partner to do everything on their side because the minute you say that the customer is going to come from point a to point b we have issues like bounce rate and customers falling off and you know all that kind of stuff so that's why we prefer uh customers um actually doing it where they have the loyalty and we are okay to work off you know apis yeah mm -hmm. so um and then obviously we use data from a perspective of how can we innovate what sort of prop differentiation are we giving this customer <laughs> we use data from a monitoring perspective we use data from a decision perspective and obviously in terms of interventions from time to time now, everyone talks about data analytics is the new oil, and we also talk about the tech being the enabler. And equally, if we put all of those things into this uh, big word, like the customer experience, it all sounds good on the paper, but uh, execution is everything. From your perspective, how do you how do you make sure that your team to make all of those things happen instead of talk to talk? You know, I love what you said. Execution is king. I, I completely agree. So I remember one of the competitor CEOs in a meeting made a comment uh, to me in front of everyone saying, you have pretty much given your strategy away. I spoke about a strategy in one of the conferences where I was a speaker. In fact, yeah. just for the record, my strat plan is up on our website. Okay, yeah. because I told him, I told him, thank you for the question, but just for the record, anybody can make a strategy very easy. <laughs> At the end of the day, it boils down to execution, and I don't think most of us know how to execute. Mm -hmm. um, the reason I say that is I am not good at execution myself. I can tell you my own example. I'm not an execution person. I'm a more of a, a big sky thinker, you know, kind of a person. So what did I do? Um, 
I always ensure I hire someone or find someone who's going to be my yin and yang, if I may say so. Who's going to be the execution person? Who's the one who's going to tell me, wait, all your books I thinking is fine, but this is how it converts itself into reality. So from an execution standpoint, I think there's two or three things. One, finding the right people to execute, building the right uh, ecosystem to execute. Second is having simple KPIs where we can track whether the execution is happening. The third is you have to have a strong review rigor on where success is happening, where there's a pitfall, where there's a failure. I think it's very, very important um, uh, to, you know, have that whole learning cycle. You talk about finding the right people and also having the KPI, but let's dig a little bit deeper, which is the root of making it happen, which is finding the right people. Finding the right people is super, super difficult. Yeah. The, the, the mechanic that we have in, the, in place as of today, most of them are, pure, are, are very much looking at the keyword on resume. And then you go into all of these uh, uh, tests and also the interview, but often it still doesn't guarantee that we'll find the right people. Even worse, I think the market is also Clearly, this part is very manual, a lot of uh, uh, um, time consuming. Um, so market is outsourcing that to the recruiter. My question then is, how, how do you solve this problem then? How do you find the right people to, to start with? It's a, it's a challenge the whole industry has today. Yeah? All industries have today. Uh, Correct. It's not, a, it's not something that is unique to insurance. We, everyone yes. we live in a world where if you are in the new age skill sets for example data cyber security data engineering etc cetera, etc cetera, you are in an employee market where yeah. there are too few people and too many people chasing them if you are in a you know a, a role where your data entry simple servicing etc there are too few roles and too many companies Mm. So um, there it's an employer market and that's why, you know, you see not enough jobs. So that's why you sometimes get confused saying jobs are scarce. Jobs are not scarce in the areas where, uh, you know, we need the skill set. They simply are not available. Now, three parts to this conversation, right? If you look at our employee NPS study, it is very, it's positive. But if I break it by age group, it is terrible below 30 years. Why is that? Because as insurers, we are very good at managing people who are 30 plus and 40 plus. We don't know how to manage a 23 or a 24 year old because their needs are different. Their requirements are different. Their expectations are different. Mm. You can't apply the same philosophy that you apply to a 45 year old to a 23 year old. Their yeah. lives are very different. Mm. So coming back, um, I think there's three parts. The first one is being aware of your different employee needs. The second one is ensuring you have a strong talent management process and you will not be able to retain everybody. My own sense is roughly 10% of your company, if they are strong people, that's probably a good start. And my job is to ensure that 10% core I build on it. That 10% becomes 15% or 20% at some point. We won't do that. And that core I'm keeping. How do I keep them? I keep them through engagement. I keep them through giving them the right amount of challenges. I keep them through developing them. I keep them through giving them growth and obviously monitoring, right? The third aspect is how do I bring in new talent, fresh talent, and give them the space to be able to have substantial work that they can do. So we have a very strong internship program where we convert quite a few staff from internship to permanent staff because that helps refresh our workforce, but also bring in that new thinking, new philosophy, etc. Yes, 
70 percent of them will go after year one or year two but the idea is to continuously build on that because today maybe your 10 percent of your talent keeps the lights moving but tomorrow comes from the second batch of people 10 percent. that is okay that's a really unique numbers that i i, I am hearing um thanks for sharing. unfortunately unfortunately <laughs> can't keep everyone it's as simple as that yeah it's true it's true i i suppose i found that one of the key thing like you say earlier is um, understanding their needs and understanding their unique needs so what often i try to do is try to understand what is their long-term expectation for their own professional career and then try to align that with the company objectives yeah. in a role that they can achieve both at the same time uh, it's, uh, it's not an easy task. <laughs> My final question for you uh, is, <clears throat> now that if you have all of those in place, how, how, how do you help them to, to try as hard as possible? How do you help them to innovate? Uh, it's so a great that... question. Uh, again, I think you have a yeah. lot of good questions. I, I think the first thing is, I'm a strong believer in empowerment. Mm. You have to empower people. Mm. You know, the world is gone where you spoon feed people. So you have to empower people. That's the first one. Second is you have to provide them the right level of support when they're quiet. Mm -hmm. Third is you have to build a culture where people can open up, be transparent, uh, speak up openly, not be worried about things. Yeah. The fourth is they have to see success, even if it is small. And the last one is you got to walk the talk as a leader. If you're transparent, your team will be transparent. Mm. If you're approachable, your team will be approachable. Mm. And you got to cut out viruses. Every team, every company will have some viruses. Now, what do I mean by virus? People who don't fit into your culture. That doesn't mean they're bad people. I don't think people are bad anyways. It just means they don't fit into our culture or we don't give them what they need. And right. it's very really important if they cannot fit in, then we have to take that mutual decision of finding better things to do. Otherwise, that can seriously impact your cultural environment. Empower is one another word that sometimes people use quite a bit. I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you give some example? How do you empower your 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 direct report or maybe some 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 area to empower them the cfo of my thailand business is 32. wow yeah so uh my uh e-commerce business uh in our uh you know new business that we are starting is probably in his mid-30s right uh, the whole team is mid is 30 or below so and we empower them you go and do the innovation you disrupt and you know if things go wrong it's fine we are behind you uh, the idea is that's the cost for innovation but we hope things work um for me for empowerment i also look at are we constantly innovating and how much of that innovation is because the board said so or i said so or my team said so and I can tell you, most of the things we have done are not because of any of this. It's because the team came up with the idea and we created the environment for the team to go and do it. I really, really like that. I think that is one of the things that perhaps in the bigger organization um, struggle a lot. I, I always believe that to make data, to make analytics powerful it's not because of these data scientists who are sitting in the corporate never talk to the customer and come up with this brilliant idea i mean it does happen from time to time but i think it's often the front line the people who deal with the customer who deal with the process who who understand the challenges that whether they face or the customer face how do you bring how do you allow those people to to give that feedback to your uh <clears throat> To your corporate team, to your the tech enabler team, um, to to solve those problems. I think that's probably one thing that is hardly uh, approachable. You have to, you have to make the organization approachable. 
-hmm. You have to make it okay to give feedback. It won't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. You have to walk the talk. You have it's not easy at all. This one, there's no framework or formats or you know mm -hmm. consultant presentations that are going to help you. You got to do your stuff. You got to go and meet people, listen to them, and they listen to you differently, right? There are different personalities. Some people like to talk. Some people like to email. Some people will only tell you their feedback in anonymous Slido or <laughs> uh, and some people, when you meet them, are very different to you know when you're in a meeting, uh, in a larger meeting. So again, we have to use different frameworks to get to know people. Mm -hmm. and and also, it's very important as leaders to understand that symbols matter. If if you show disappointment in a meeting, when a failure happens, they're not going to do it again. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's why it's important to show it's okay, it happens. Now, what can we do better? Mm. It's not easy, but you got to do it. That's the only way you can do that culture. So, and, you know, and I think that's, that's where the rubber hits the road uh, for us as leaders. Um, how do we uh, how do we ensure that we always publicly appreciate and privately give constructive criticism or constructive feedback? It's spot on. Spot on. That was a lot of uh, really useful uh, uh, experience that you, you you were sharing. Thank you so much for that. Is there anything else that you would like to share about your work? No, I'm 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 good, Jason. And and again, if there's anybody has any questions, want to have a conversation, they can always reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm quite active, um, and uh, I do run uh, from time to time. Uh, I give out uh, my time for mentoring sessions as well. Uh, mm. I give out, I'll give it out on LinkedIn actually, where I send messages saying ten people I can mentor over the next you know quarter, and wow. I do that as well. So it's something I I like to do at my personal time. It's mostly yeah. weekends. That's my only restriction, but otherwise I do that as well. Sorry, can you say the last bit again? Maybe the... only on weekends. Oh, because okay. Because, uh, okay. <laughs> Now, my final two questions that I have for every single one uh, of my guests. The first one first being, what is your most important first principle? You have to be passionate about what you do. If you aren't passionate, you shouldn't be doing that job. Uh, for me, passion is everything. If, if you don't have the passion, how are you ever going to you know, make a difference? Right? Uh, so you have to have that, that real excitement to do something. And that's what I look at people. Uh, do they have that infectious attitude? And I believe that's my differentiation. You will see me at eight in the morning, 10 in the night, I, I last week I remember I flew in at 11:30 in the night. Next day morning I had to fly out again, and you will not find me with any different face. <laughs> that's that's me. Uh, yes, I'm not perfect. I have a lot of issues too, right? I, as I told before, I'm not the best in execution. Uh, I am too high level sometimes, and that's why I need people to come and tell me, "Calm down. Let me tell you how to do these things." <laughs> But passion is something, it's, it's my number one, uh, you know, if I say that's my main uh, differentiation, uh, if I say so. And that's something I look for in people. And in terms of principle, I have a simple principle that if you believe you can do it, you can do it. Mm. You know, who is to tell you you can't? It is yeah. for you. I think I can relate to a lot of uh, what, where you come from, especially um, when you have to go to all these different country and then start from the scratch again. Um, yeah, you, you, you. What? Who is there to tell you that you can't do it? They are. They're not paying for your bill anyway. So, <laughs> so. And you have one life. You have one life. Exactly. 
Exactly. You don't want to be sitting at 50 years old or 60 years old, sipping a cup of coffee and wondering what could I have? Yeah, what could have happened? Exactly. Final, final question. What is one book that you have read and thought it would have been better for your younger self to have? Great question. You, you will get a secret from me. I don't read books much. <laughs> I'm, I'm, more of, okay. I'm more of a podcast person. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. But I'm a big po poem person. Uh, poem. Uh, so poems are a big thing for me. So uh, if, I, if by Rudyard Kipling is something I keep reading again and again, uh, because every time I read the poem, there's a new meaning to it. Uh, the other one is uh, obviously Invectus by William Ernest Henley. Uh, the last two lines is something I always tell myself when even there's a bit of a challenge or a bad time that I'm going through. Uh, the last two lines are, I'm the master of my faith. I'm the captain of my soul. Um, you know, of course, I can't say it as good as Morgan Freeman in the movie, but... Um, <laughs> You know, it's it's something um, I love doing because poems sometimes, the beauty about great poems like this is um, every time you read it, it gives you a different meaning, a different perspective. Uh, so that's really exciting. Uh, and finally, I, I, I listen to a lot of podcasts, uh, you know, just like yours, but I listen to, um, you know, Economist, I listen to um, uh, TED Business, I listen to... Asia Insure Tech podcast. So um, it's it's my way of you know staying engaged and being being in touch. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Rohit. It's been uh, wonderful having you here. Uh, we are we have covered so much of them, like from insurance to product innovation to uh, data and tech to support that. And most most important thing is. Uh, finding the right people to 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 um, to cover all of those things. Um, thank you so much for sharing. Thanks, Jason. I appreciate it. Really good. Hello. If you enjoyed this conversation, hit that subscribe button so we can meet again. If you don't, I'll be stuck in an infinite loop. So pull that part by clicking the subscribe and help me out. You can further support us by leaving us a kind review from wherever you are listening at the end of the year. I will choose a reviewer to send a special gift to, and it might just be you. I look forward to seeing you here next week for a new adventure. If I can find my way out of this endless loop. See ya!